Right, well, what I want to do today, the other lectures in this particular series have been very much on uh, the cities themselves. For example, we've looked at the myth of Venice, uh, we looked at uh, Arezzo in particular in relation to Piero della Francesca. Uh, what I'm going to do today is look at the um, portrait in Italy in the 18th century. And basically, the idea behind this lecture is that uh, portraiture well, at that time in Rome was influenced very much by the British and the kind of portraiture style that you get is an answer or in response to the demands of the grand tourist, the English aristocracy who went to become uh, you know, connoisseurs and cultured um, but needed um, a reference or a memento in many ways of their change from being simply a young Englishman into becoming a cultured uh, European. Uh, and the portrait uh, by, in particular, Pompeo Bartoni uh, was used to forge this link. So I'm really going to show the way in which Italian portraiture uh, is extremely influenced by the English at this time. Uh, I want to just sort of begin to sort of look at very briefly, I mean this is just a very brief generalisation, um, the age of reason. When we sort of I put forward this lecture of a series it was you know, the lure of Italy in the age of reason. The age of reason of course the 18th century, the age of the enlightenment and in particular led by the French with um, Voltaire, um, with uh, the, the encyclopedists and so on, with this idea that the real world exists and that it can be studied and mastered, all right? In many ways, it's the sort of intellectual forerunner of the Industrial Revolution, which will take place at more or less a century later, where the world is mastered by machines with, you know, the consequences that occur. So um, I wanted to look at the kind of portraiture that you got in France in the same period that we'll be looking at the portraiture in Italy. Now, um, here we have the de la Tour portrait of Duval de l'Epinoy, who was a, a, someone who worked in, with, at the French court. And here he shows himself, um, he was asked to be seen very much as the quintessential man of the Enlightenment. So he's surrounded by uh, the geographer's globe, by the encyclopedia is here, he's got a lens in his hand, um, he's interested in the sciences on the cutting edge of these new developments. Uh, and he sort of turns towards us, you know, as a, a man of science, this sort of witty, uh, sophisticated uh, man. All right? So these are the, the things that he wants to be portrayed with. He wants to be seen um, as a man of knowledge. Now, what is happening in Italy at about the same time? Well, you've got um, Tiepolo ceilings. I mean, so it's a very good sort of you know, comparison in many ways. With the Virgin appearing to St. Filippo Neri, um, you're still getting the tail end of the painting of the Counter-Reformation. And the Italians uh, were not particularly interested in uh, having their portraits done. I mean, you still had the aristocracy, but there isn't that sort of upper middle class, uh, that bourgeoisie that has the money uh, and the aspirations to have themselves uh, uh, portraited. So we still get the, the major artists of this time are still painting religious subjects. Now here you have San Filippo Neri, um, one of the orders that came out of the uh, Council of Trent, uh, and here he is uh, in the church, and the church is about to collapse. You know, the ceiling's falling in, and as I said before, why wasn't the Virgin here when our ceiling? Anyway, anyway so yeah, the, the, ceiling's, the ceiling's collapsing, and the Virgin comes in and holds it up, okay? And this is him saying, thank you for that. So you've got this extraordinary sort of Baroque painting again, um, but very much related to the cult of Mary, related to the cult of saints, and uh, something which everyone can relate to, a ceiling falling in, um, being part of religious art, right? Because this is what the Counter-Reformation art, of course, was, was about, um, that the common people, through their common experiences, through their own senses, could um, uh, accede, accede to sort of um, higher ideas of religion. 
Now, this, the reason for there sort of being this great discrepancy, I think, is that, of course, you don't have a united Fr Italy as you have a united France. Now, this is at the time of the unification of Italy. Um, this is what um, Italy looked like. You've got the papal states. You've got Tuscany. Remember, we looked at this last week. Um, you've got Romagna. You, these are being ruled by someone different, uh, the uh, Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Sardinia and the Piedmont are, again, sort of separate areas. So this is one of the, the, the reasons why you don't get these sort of united ideas in through Italy. Um, and in the meantime, of course, uh, what happens? We've got uh, in the 18th century uh, the high point of the Grand Tour. Now, now, some of you have heard so much about the Grand Tour that they probably can talk about it with me, but um, you really need to, if you don't mind, some people here haven't sort of um, heard about it, so we need to just talk about it briefly. <laughs> Um, this, I think, is a hilarious sort of depiction of, you know, the boys on the continent. Um, unfortunately, I don't even, I don't know who did it. I've been trying to find this out, but, I mean, it's almost like our boys at the pub. But here they are, they're, you know, but, oh, there's a, there's a few old buildings in the background. There's the Colosseum, you know, and, oh, we've got, you know, completely out of kilter. I mean, you actually don't get the Colosseum with the Arch of Constantine right next door to each other, but who cares? It's Rome, you know. Um, so here they are, and these are the aristoc British aristocracy that are going to invade um, Italy in many ways. Now, um, the, the Grand Tour, what was it? It was the, the aims of the tour. It, it started out a long way back in the time of Elizabeth I, uh, when she realised that she needed um, diplomats uh, in the courts of Europe, that, that Britain, Great Britain was too um, isolated, uh, and so she actually sent out people to stay abroad for a, for a certain amount of time to learn the customs of the others and to learn this, the language, and it begins from that point. Then the aristocracy start doing it, and then it becomes, by the 18th century, de rigueur for young English or British, or Great British aristocrats and upper middle class landowners to do the Grand Tour. And this was something that lasted for at least two years. You didn't sort of flit over and flit back. You were supposed to immerse yourself and to come back a worthy um, person to enter uh, the House of Commons, well, it wouldn't be the House of Commons, be the House of Lords, and to take up your position um, as a Lord. But there were originally sort of quite high aims behind it. And the first one was to act in accordance with Locke's essay concerning human understanding on the importance of change of stimuli and the obligation to use one's observations for the welfare of society. Now, this was this idea that basically um, if you didn't change stimuli, it's like not changing air in the room. There's not enough oxygen for you to breathe. If you don't change the stimuli, you don't get new thoughts. Uh, you don't expand your mind. And it's on the basis of this that you get the idea of travel broadening the mind. Right? That really literally comes from that. That travel gives you these new experiences. And of course, this was supposed to be all in the uh, cause of, of the home country. You know, a man who is enlightened. Um, it's also to construct the connoisseur. Now, this is something that we're going to look at particularly in this, uh, in this lecture, this, the importance of the fine arts in the making of an English gentleman and how they uh, attempted to bring this back with them in one way or another. To develop the appreciation of the picturesque, induce a superficial study of foreign language, and when I say superficial, I mean it. All right, self-reliance, so to reinforce, and this is probably one of the, the basic tenets, is to reinforce the value of English, social, religious, and political institutions. Right, that's the first thing. You, even though it, you appear to be going overseas with an open mind to experience what is happening in other countries, there is this preconceived idea of the superiority of the British system, and you go actually with that idea of proving it. Uh, which is quite a, a, a dangerous thing. So they actually basically all coming back, came back with the idea that Italy was a wonderful place except for the Italians who had, had really basically uh, not lived up to the mantle of, of the ancient Romans and that, thank God, the British were there to take on the mantle of empire and to continue the higher ideals of the Roman uh, empire. So, and it is, so the, the other main thing was to see the sad fate of empires that fell into popishness. Now remember that these young boys are, are practically all Protestants, right, and saw popishness as a problem. And pop, yeah, I mean, they were, they were in, even English Catholics had problems with um, Italian Catholicism. That's why the, the term popishness even relates to those who were Catholics in, in England.
And of course the last century is Rome and Venice, moral lessons in government. Right, Venice of course as we saw the other week had been a great maritime empire and so the British identified with that. They were now beginning to ride the quest, uh, crest of the wave of colonialism so they saw that they had taken over as the great maritime power as, as Venice had been and they see themselves now as taking over from Rome. Now, as I, I think some of you have seen this before again, but it's important that um, there were two ways of looking at things. They were really interested in foreigners, but on the other hand, thought they were ghastly. Right? According to the law of custom, and this is Edward Gibbon, who hasn't yet written his decline and fall, uh, uh, which is very interesting when you actually put the title in the context of the Grand Tour. According to the law of custom, perhaps of, and perhaps of reason, Foreign travel completes the education of an English gentleman. However, the tour has made me a better Englishman than when I set out. All right? So in other words, though I've seen more elegant manners and more refined art, I have perceived so many real evils mixed with these tinsel advantages that they have only served to make the plain honesty and blunt freedom of my own country appear all the more valuable to me. In other words, you know, long live feudalism. Um, and also um, uh, Thomas Pelham, and this was very much the mindset by the 18th <coughs> century. Right, I think it necessary that every young man should know that there are other countries than those he lives in. That's number one. And that a Spaniard may be as happy in servitude with a capital S as an Englishman in liberty. In short, visiting other countries is the best way of weighing the perfections and imperfections of our own. However, I fear there are few where a young traveller can gain any improvement. In Italy, I believe, none. <laughs> it should be visited only as a country of fame without any regard to its inhabitants. Now, that was very much the attitude um, with which they, they went. Now, um, all right, the, how did they do this? Um, the young man, and here the, the second Duke of Northumberland does look young, uh, is taken in with, by a man who's called a bear leader, right? Uh, in other words, this is the man who's going to lead him from one city to another. I think that is where the analogy comes from, from the medieval fairs where a poor bear in chains was taken to perform from one place to another. Or it could refer, refer to the fact that these young men were so difficult to control that you actually had to chain them down. I'm, I don't know. Um, but anyhow, often they were um, tutors from one of the universities or retired clergymen. Um, but at the, in the 17th century, they actually ran quite a degree of... Uh, it was quite dangerous for these, these tutors, particularly those who were um, Protestants. In fact, there was one tutor who was actually imprisoned by the Inquisition for something like uh, 17 years, uh, whereas his charge got off because, of course, he was, had connections through the noble families of Italy. So to begin with, it wasn't uh, an easy job. Um, this is where they arrived, um, coming up the Via Flaminia, arriving in Piazza del Popolo. The guide says, ecco Roma, there's Rome, and in they come. This is before Napoleon actually got it, um, Piazza del Popolo, uh, and fashion. This was all destroyed by Napoleon. Just a minute, where are we? Yes, he destroys all this part and um, develops the Pincian Garden up there. The French had a huge um, impact on this part of Rome, as we'll see uh, later on. Now, um, there was um, a real problem. This is, some of you might have been to see the um, caricature and satire that exhibition is on at the NGV at the moment with Gilray and Rollinson. Well, um, it was Rollinson who actually does quite a lot of um, pillaring of the grand tourist as a sort of ignoramus who is totally taken in. Um, and some people came back, of course, with unwanted characteristics. In other words, they, <laughs> they had actually been too much taken over. I mean, they, the poor Italians were, were pilloried either for being hopeless Casanovas or being effeminate. Uh, sort of Nigels, so you, they couldn't have it one way or another. Um, and here, this fellow has been completely taken in with all the all the sort of the finery and the mincingness and the excess interest uh, to clothes. And here's the plain, blunt Englishman that we were talking about before, and um, this fellow who can't even put his hat on without a. Um, pinches, which actually was the fashion at the time. And here you have another thing, the macaroni and the ramblers. The macaroni, of course, were the people who came back from Italy. Um, and um, at one stage they were actually going to pass a law in Parliament which prohibited mincing and lisping and outrageous hand gestures because <laughs> it, it had really become just over the top. 
Anyway, the development of the tool, just very quickly, the period of growth, this is the heyday, which corresponds to the decline in university education. You then go into the decline and difficulties of travel. This is about the time of the Austrian War of Secession, um, uh, succession, sorry, uh, and it was impossible to travel um, across the continent. Uh, and so uh, the people like Canaletto, as we saw last <coughs> week, came to, to paint in England. Then um, you get, when the tour is resumed, there are two things that, that happen. First of all, women begin taking the tour, and that's, you know, it's no longer quite the way it used to be, right? Because one of the main aspects behind this tour was the sort of aristocratic male bonding. Uh, uh, no matter what, if they had nothing else in common, they had all done the tour together, all right? Um, and with women, it was, diff it was different. And women also started writing back le letters saying what it was about. You then get a revival at the beginning of the 19th century um, where you get the development of romanticism, this idea, and you no longer went on the tour to become a better political person, but to become a better person in yourself. So this is this, this movement of, of the improvement of, of the idea of imag imagination and sensibility. And then finally, with the development of tourism um, for the middle classes, that was the end of the Grand Tour completely. It no longer had its aristocratic cachet. Um, you know, the sort of middle classes and heaven forbid, the working classes were actually going on these uh, um, uh, Cook's tours. And, and they actually had, um, the aristocrats actually had ideas about it that, that um, if the working class actually got too near paintings, their breath was so bad it would ruin the paintings. I mean, <laughs> you actually have uh, newspaper articles, you know, talking about the working class, that they were, as they are and were in France, you know, the, the class dangereuse, you know, the working class, dangerous class. All right, so, however, during all this time, it, you had to have um, some representation of yourself as having changed um, from being a callow youth into being um, a sophisticated man of the world. And what was, this was done by sitting to the portrait painter of the time, who was Pompeo <coughs> Battoni. Now, um, as we're going to look at the development of this, we, we're going to look at, in particular, how important this was. The portrait proclaims accomplishments, um, in other words, you know, what your, your particular accomplishments were, articulates allegiances and consolidates status. All right, now, um, it, these would be hung in the major halls uh, or, or uh, manors of the aristocracy uh, and would sort of show that this young man was continuing the dynasty uh, in the way he should. Now, if any of you, if, has any of you seen that film, The Duchess? Yes. Yes, okay, right. All right, well, I've actually got portraits of them, but that comes out very clearly in that, that the, the main point of, of anything was dynasty, continuing the dynasty. And the portrait actually is something that, that uh, bears witness to this. Um, icons of social, political and even erotic authority, as we'll see <coughs> with, the <coughs> sorry, with the Venetian portraits. And also, what we'll also see later on is that this idea of um, becoming a man of taste shows that you are a good man, that virtue uh, in the old Roman sense relates to taste, and therefore you are fit to rule. So, right? so it's not, you're not a dilettante because you like art, um, it means that you are someone of, of solid moral qualities. All right, now I want to look at the British as the New Romans and the importance of aesthetics. All right, now this is the, going to be the painting that I'm going to refer back to uh, constantly, uh, as it's the, it is the quintessential uh, grand turret portrait, all right? So, and the name says it all too. So Wyndham, natural Wyndham. <laughs> I don't know what his mum called him, Win Winnie or something. And he was the sixth baronet, I mean, you know. It's very interesting, actually, when you're reading stuff about the British that it People are always given their titles, and you read French stuff. I don't know if you know this, notice this too, Fiona, but the French never are referred to it by their title. They're just referred to as so and so. But here you have it. Often, you, by the time you've got the man's pedigree, you've lost the point of the whole chapter. You know, sixth baronet, soon to become, you know, fourth earl of, of Pigsworth, or, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, getting back to Sir Wyndham, Natural Wyndham. Um, absolutely quintessential and we're going to be looking now at 
where these aspects of this particular portrait type which is developed to depict these ideas of the Grand Tourist, where do these aspects come from? How does Batoni pull this together? Um, right, now before I actually do that, I want to actually talk about um, the importance of being a connoisseur. All right, now Zoffany, of course, was um, a painter at the French, at the English court who was uh, sent over to depict the Grand Tourists. And what we have here is, um, what some of you have seen before, is this idea of the way in which um, paintings were hung. All right? And this was called the gentlemanly hang. And um, you can actually, uh, uh, totally without, without uh, uh, yes, anyway, uh, if you actually go to um, the Ballarat um, uh, Art Gallery, you actually sort of see um, the way in which the paint, there were, uh, places where you could fix the paintings all the way up the wall so it sort of gives you a little bit the idea and also this was very popular at the time the, the red background as well um, based on discoveries of Herculaneum all right, uh, which we'll be talking about alright now gen these gentlemen here then knew the catchwords of aesthetics all right it was something that you had to have to prove that you're a gentleman and they knew the idea of the, the you had to when you were entering into a debate about art you had to talk about either color you know as against design or color against drawing in other words the venetians against the romans um, you had to also be able to compare um, Raphael, of course, who was the high point, it was considered the high point of the Renaissance, against Rubens over there. So colour against structure again. And so paintings and statues would be arranged to bring out these contrasts. Um, and here you have the centrality, right? You've got the Venus de Urbino. It's not just a lot of men looking at a naked woman. I mean, you could look at it that way, couldn't you? But that's not the way in which you were supposed to. It's the um, centrality of the female nude all right and of course the female nude of the renaissance literally the new birth of the venus um uh, or the aphrodite over here so you have the um the two uh, great female nudes so you can compare them and these are the two times of art that the grand tourists looked at antiquity and then the rebirth of antiquity which is the renaissance they shuddered in their boots uh and their silk scarves uh under at when anyone mentioned the ghastly baroque you know it was sort of like the brick veneer uh, for them <laughs> all right so um you have all these paintings here for example you've got some paintings and zoffany very carefully uh re repaints these paintings so you've got a sort of a painting of inside a painting and also the people who are looking at it also become part of the painting as well it's quite an interesting sort of mise en en valeur so here you um, and it's so interesting also to see that paintings now which have been reattributed um, are there this one of just St. John the Baptist was considered to be um, a Raphael at the time so it just sort of shows you how rubbery these uh, concepts are so on this side then you have the, the sort of the, the structure of Raphael and over here you have Rubens you have the four philosophers uh, and the other ones. Now, you also get a lot of portraits here. Remember the portrait heads of the Romans, portraits of uh, old portraits here referring to, this is a Holbein, one of the ones of the um, Tudors, and then you get up here portraits of philosophers. So this is um, combining or showing that these people, all of whom are perfectly recognisable, you know, you, know they, you can actually get a chart and you can say this is Lord so-and-so, they are sort of being seen in the context of the philosophers who are the great continuers of the Western tradition of thought. So um, these people, by being painted in this situation, discussing art in this way, see themselves as taking on the mantle of the great sort of discourses of history and art history. Art history, by the way, which had really only just started to become a real discipline with Winkleman. All right, so um, these people then um, are shown as people of taste and as being worthy of the ancient world by having their portraits, be by becoming part of that world, by, by being painted um, as a painting. Now, um, Zoffany also painted Charles Townley's library in, in Park Street. Now, what you have here is this sort of extraordinary conglomeration of, uh, of, of statues. Um, the first thing is, that where did he get them from? Um, and this, uh, at the time, uh, the Italians actually 
had very little store by their own heritage. Um, archaeology was really only just beginning. I mean, people were actually starting to actually excavate Rome, but they were excavating it with the, 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 the sole purpose of mining it for objects that they could sell or that they could collect themselves. There was no <coughs> sense of the preservation of the past. And in fact, this doesn't really even start until the 19th century with the French Revolution, where you actually start, and Napoleon will bring much of this idea to, to Rome. Um, this idea of preserving the past and of having museums set up chronologically where you get this idea of a development. Um, the second thing is that um, most of these pieces here um, wouldn't have been dug out of the ground looking like that. I mean, when you look at it, you think, my God, where did they get them from? Um, many of them would be plaster casts, um, and if not, they would have been repaired and bits stuck on. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, this was a sort of flourishing trade um, at the time of the Grand Tour. So what you have here then um, are these gentlemen um, almost indistinguishable from the statues, well, indistinguishable. I mean, they're, they're sort of sitting in a random position, as are the statues. So in other words, this, they are sort of identified completely with the ancient world, even though they are sort of reading the ancient poets um, and they're you know, staring at them. Um, they are the continuous, they are taking on the burden of um, putting forward the ideas of antiquity uh, in the, the modern world, which was the 18th century. And also what you have here is this idea of leisure, which is very, very important, right? The aristocracy, an aristocrat is an aristocrat because he doesn't have to work. And it was all based on this sense of feudalism in many ways. The aristocrat lived from land revenue. Uh, and therefore, because he um, had, had um, leisure, he could devote himself to the higher pursuits of mankind and therefore be worthy of ruling his country. Of course, this was not at all the case. Ruling in Britain at the time was a matter of you know, bribes and you know, jockeying for position and so on. But this is the way in which they present themselves to the world. And the third aspect, of course, is this idea of male bonding. Not a woman in sight, you know, uh, well, maybe a, an Aphrodite or something, but let's face it, she's dead. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's no one to, to really disturb. And also the, the dog, which will um, be quite important in the portraits. Now, if you couldn't actually get um, your own, uh, you know, plaster cast, what you could get from Panini uh, was a painting of paintings. Uh, uh, so instead of actually going and buying, you know, a veduta or, of, of the Colosseum, you get someone who will paint the vedutas here. So this has been very much an interesting way in which uh, an Italian artist now presents his own city as a fragmented numbers of tourist sites all right it's it's sort of the equivalent um of of the post the, the fold out postcard that you're given when you walk down into the forum all right what is my city oh look it is it, it, the, you know it's the Colosseum. it's the Colosseum. it's the temple of so and so it's all these in fact even made up is the arch of constantine all of these many of which are plaster casts i mean there are this laaco one which is quite interesting can you um, i want you to remember that outstretched arm. This is 1758 um, and you'll, you'll see that this is actually changed later on. So there's this idea of collecting plaster casts, collecting sites and also the sort of the witty sort of play of difference, um, you know, um, you know, we'd have this in your room and you'd ask your dinner guests, you know, who is that? You know, oh, is it the dying gladiator? It was considered to be a dying gladiator, now it's a dying gall. And so I'm sure in a hundred years they'll find it. It's, I don't know, somebody else. But uh, anyway, so all of this was is to be put up in your home when you got back. Now, I just, this is, I think I better leave that because you can't see it. I just wanted to show the importance of um, bits and pieces that were collections in um, people, the artist studios. Now, Again, this is a sort of cartoons. This is the English um, on the Grand Tour by the 19th century. They aren't able to actually go and get real things, so they go to you know a shop which has all these replicas, and they're sort of sitting there, um, sort of uh, you know waiting to be served. And here we have um, a, a Rawlinson as well um, with the the Conoscenti contemplating the beauties of antiquity, um, which have been made up of out of clay and stained with tobacco juice and. Um, you've got, you know, you've got Mount Vesuvius erupting and you've got some people dressed up and you've got a goat. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, really sort of <coughs> making fun of people. All right, now, Bartolomeo Cavascepi was uh, uh, an Italian who uh, started out his career as a sculptor 
and made his mark by restoring uh, well, the concept of restoration at the time um, these uh, objects which were dug up. Now I just want to give you um, an example of this. Right? This of course had already emerged hundreds of years earlier but um, when people dug up statues they were of course broken and um, it didn't matter to people at the time that they thought well this probably must have been an Aphrodite so you've got the body and I couldn't actually get you a good example of this so I have to explain it you'd have a body that looked as though it was in the position of an Aphrodite let's say she had her hands like that so you just bung an Aphrodite's head on maybe from somewhere else or maybe a plaster cast is made up and if, for example in the Borghese galleries there's the uh, statue of uh, Marcus Curtius on a horse well I mean all they had was the front part of the horse and so then you've got him which is all from somewhere else and the back of the horse from somewhere else in fact, it's, it's just simply an imagination. And this was what restoration was called at the time. I mean, if, you know, what do you restore it to? An idea or back to a certain point in time? I mean, this was the big debate uh, in the 19th century. Anyhow, um, in the 18th century, you get people restoring statues. In fact, there's actually um, a thesis which has been written, uh, was written about 10 years ago by a woman who actually said that she thought that this whole statue was a joke, uh, that one of the, uh, Michelangelo had actually made it and uh, presented it. Anyway, he's been, there's still going on about that. Anyhow, you notice that that painting that we had back of Panini, yeah. the arm was straight out. Well, um, about something like about 50 years after the arm um, was straight out. Um, in fact, Michelangelo, I think it was, found um, another piece, an elbow and said, as, as he'd always said, it should be like this. And so they then removed the arm and put a different arm on. So it just sort of shows you, um, you know, very, how very sort of uh, dicey it all is. And these clearly um, come from a different, uh, different time. All right, now this is the great time. Now, why am I telling you all about this? Because this, um, the importance of antiquity for the grand tourists. Now, Rome was the fount of the classics. One went, one had to go to Rome. One could do anything one liked on the grand tour. You could go to Venice, you could go to, if you wanted to, Naples, Paris, oh, okay. But definitely Rome, the fount of all knowledge. And the Romans themselves were now beginning to... Um, Found, found great collections. This is the Borghese um, Palace, uh, which was set up in, to exhibit uh, the uh, antiquities which were beginning to come to light. And in fact, Rome now is becoming a kind of a gigantic digging site where all, you know, you're getting Rome, Nero's palaces and so on and so on. And this is the interior um, of the Borghese Palace, which um, now starts to be set out in a different way um, so that people can admire the collection. Um, and someone who was very important to um, Battoni is uh, the Cardinal Albani, who was the great link between the British grand tourists uh, and uh, the antiquities of the time. Remember in Venice we had um, O'Meary and uh, was it Sidney um, Smith, uh, who was the consul there, who was the person who, who linked Canaletto to the Grand Tours. And here, he, these, these aristocrats built uh, these wonderful buildings just around uh, the centre part of Rome to exhibit these, uh, their, their collections and the Grand Tourists came along for conversazione. Now what kind of conversazione they had with their limited Italian, because the Italian spoke no English, I don't know, but I suppose it was the mutual rubbing of aristocratic soldiers that did the trick. Anyway, I just want just to further reinforce the importance of antiquity, and this is why you're going to get these antiquities appearing constantly, and in fact, the only other aspect that appears in the Grand Tourist Portrait um, was Johann uh, Joachim Winkelmann, who uh, starts out as a Protestant, converts to Catholicism and works in the Vatican libraries, uh, and will be the first person to formulate officially the, the, the beauties of uh, the ancient world in his, in his treatise on, on the beauty of the ancient world. Uh, and he divides um, Greek art into four different periods and really starts this idea of historical, chronological analysis in, 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 in aesthetics. So um, he was someone who was very, very important at the time. I haven't got time to really go into him, but he was the lover of um, a portrait painter who was the great rival of Battoni. All right, now, um, 
again, the other thing that was really important at the time was the discovery of Pompeii in 1748. Now, this was the heyday of the, Pompe the uh, Batoni portrait painting. All right, Herculaneum, I think, had been founded in, what, 1736, fairly early. But um, you get the um, importance of the ancient world and this reinvestment of time and energy in digging up Rome. So we get now to Batoni, who, as you could see, would be flourishing in about the 1840s or the 18, uh, 1740s, 1750s. Um, he comes from Lucca, so he's a Tuscan painter, uh, comes to paint uh, in Rome and uh, does the usual uh, sorts of paintings that you would expect an 18th century uh, Italian painter to do, right? The Ecstasy of St. Uh, Catherine of Siena, she's the patron saint of Rome. Uh, in, you can find where she, uh, her rooms, everything, just near uh, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. Um, you also have the death of Malaga, the sort of other sort of painting which was very common at the time, um, reference to the ancient world. Now Malaga also was supposed to be, uh, was a young man, the, the story is actually quite important because a statue that is, is used in the grand tourist portraits will come up later. Um, his, uh, the story was that he was, it was prophesied that he would live so long as this particular fire brand wasn't in the fire. And uh, he ends up participating in a, a race, you know, with Atlanta. And uh, Atlanta wins, and uh, Malaga's brothers are happy and try and take the, the prize from her. And Malaga steps in to protect his beloved and kills his two brothers. And his mother doesn't like that and puts the firebrand back in the fire and he dies. So um, this is sort of, you know, he's one of the sort of great tragic heroes of the time. All right, so here we have her um, Atlanta bemoaning the death of Malaga. So this was sort of the typical sort of painting. All now, right, um, Lady for the St. Hall. Now this is um, very much a sort of the country gentleman painting. This is at the beginning of, of his career. Uh, uh, where people used to dress up, right? Uh, Lady Featherson Hoare is dressed up as Diana, see with the crescent moon, and she has the aspects of hunting. This sort of takes takes on from the, the kind of um, balls that people used to have. Remember, we talked about it with Eugenie. But however, what I want to look at in the the influence in his portrait style of Titian and Van Dyck, and this is extremely important. Now here we have, this is the one that I'm going to look at, and we're going to look at several aspects. We're first of all going to look at the stance, all right? We're going to look at the costume in particular, the importance of the hands and the face in rendering the, not just the likeness, but the uh, status of the sitter. And we're going to look at uh, the way in which this is set almost on a stage scene, this sort of Baroque court painting style, with the sort of, the, you know, you, you have the impression that you're, this man is on the threshold of, of another world. All right, now um, I just wanted to uh, make you remember that uh, these paintings weren't just sort of one on a wall. Remember, they were going to be brought back to be in the stately homes. And this is a, a tip, this is actually this painting by Pompeo Batoni would be on a wall. In fact, it's over on this wall where it's standing over here and you can't see, but it's competing against, you know, immense um, ceiling frescoes, tapestries, uh, you know, this is actually a Velasquez and, and so on. So it, it really has to hold its own. But this is one of the reasons why you go to get such extraordinary poses. All right, we're going to start off very, very, I mean, this is very brief. I just want to say that, that Pompeo Batoni refers to Titian in particular as, as the great sort of portrait painter. Uh, and Titian uses the, the hands very much to show the sort of the sensitivity and the rank of his sitter. Um, in fact, the rest of it is extremely dark and the pieces that emerge from the darkness are the face um, with the glance going in the same direction of the hands. Now, on the, the finger here, we have the signet ring showing um, the man's rank, um, but also the hand here is sort of showing him as sort of a leisured uh, sort of dilettante as well. Um, the same thing with the portrait of Charles V. Um, we have the importance of this, this man is an old man by now, 
and his hand here, he, by this time he had arthritis, uh, and the hand is sort of enclosed in a very heavy glove. It's sort of resting um, on him as though he can't move it. And sort of the, the fragility and the mortality um, of this great monarch in many ways resides in this sort of gummy hand um, as opposed to this one. So the, the, this importance of, of hands is an, a way into reading the portrait. Um, the other aspects that um, Batoni will use from Titian um, are in particular this importance of dogs, um, which you get in all aristocratic portraits. Um, but again, there's a different type of dog according to who the sitter is. So right here you have these little playful dogs, which um, you would never get a woman with a hound. You know, the hound was a sort of the majestic uh, sign of uh, uh, aristocracy. Um, I just wanted to also show he would be drawing on Veronese with the, the posturing um, of this sitter. Now, the person who, um, or the painter, who was referenced the most by uh, Batoni was Van Dyck, uh, who, as you know, was a painter who goes from Antwerp to um, work at the court of Charles I. Now, the reason why it was very important to reference uh, Van Dyck was because the ancestors or the fathers or the grandfathers of the, the present crop of young tourists would have had their portraits done by Van Dyck. So therefore, to get a kind of a homogeneity or this idea of, of dynasty or <coughs> continuity of, of privilege, uh, which is obvious to anyone who would come and see these halls full of paintings, um, he needed to reference aspects of Van Dyck's style. And we'll see this um, in particular uh, with the, uh, the setting, um, but also with the um, form of the collars. So you often get the grand tourists of the 18th century with a kind of anachronism in their costume. And this is deliberately done to make them look as though they are really the descendants of the Van Dyck uh, style. Um, the other thing which is very important, uh, again, is going to be this um, aspect, influence on, on hands and the, sort of the delicacy of the gestures of the sitter and also the emphasis on very rich um, uh, costume colours. Right? And you'll, you'll see that with the, the Bartone. All right, now I just want to quickly look at, at contemporary portraitists. I mean, who was he competing against? Well, he was mainly competing against other English portraitists uh, um, who also worked, went, took their easels over to, to Rome because they knew that this was where they were going to get their commissions. So um, Hudson, for example, was someone who was working there at the time. And you'll see um, this standard posture already is there in 1742. Uh, he was the man who founded the Foundling Hospital in, in London. Um, so here you've got the, you know, this idea of the attributes, all right, this is, he's showing, you know, this is the, the, the founding piece of paper of the Foundling Hospital, but he's in Rome, you can see, because he's leaning on a, a sacrophagus, all right, and they'd only just discovered then that the Romans actually buried their dead, right, it was quite interesting, until then they thought that they, they cremated them, it was actually, they were jewel things, so this also was showing that um, this, um, person or the person who painted him was at the cutting edge of archaeology or the cutting edge of knowledge of the ancient world by leaning on a sarcophagus like that. All right, now that's just to give you this same cross-legged look. I'll come back to him later. Um, Carlo Moratti was also working in Rome at the time. He was, uh, or at least, at least 100 years earlier, but you actually get uh, the cross-legged look. Um, again, even a hundred years earlier, you get this development of the importance of leaning on something which represents the past. Casali, also uh, working in Rome in 18, uh, 1738, um, is going to produce this idea of coming from the past towards the present, which we will look at in a moment. All right, so there's a direct link between the historic past the embodiment of which is this person coming forward and writing about it for the future. All right, now Francesco Trevisani, uh, in <clears throat> earlier than, than Batoni, um, gives us the beginnings of the typical, what will be the grand tourist portrait. Um, the man, the Englishman, who is uh, dressed 
uh, in an Italian style, but he doesn't lose any of his upright Englishness. All right, the alertness um, is still there, even though he's wearing um, very sort of lavish uh, clothes. Now he's gesturing towards the past, all right, and the past here is of course the Colosseum. Um, why the Colosseum? Well, everyone would recognise the Colosseum, wouldn't it? I mean, you don't want some twiddly little temple that just looks like a pile of bricks. I mean, you have to come home and have someone to immediately recognise, oh, you were in Rome, were you, Eddie, all right? So. Um, <laughs> There you get, so you get the, and the, you have to also represent the fact that it's falling down, <coughs> all right? There's no point in having the Colosseum seen from the other side because it might look as though it's standing up. You see, the whole point was that the Romans had not preserved their own culture. They'd let it crumble. <laughs> They'd let it dis degenerate. Thank God we're here. We are now going to take the lessons of the ancient world, the, the lessons of the Roman Republic, you know, uprightness, etc. But they also, we're going to take the lesson that the present Romans give us that this is what happens to um, an empire which is overweening, which becomes decadent, right? So, therefore, the crumbling ruin in the background has these dual messages. I've been there, but also we will not make the same mistakes. We are the British aristocracy. We'll carry the message through, but in a different way, via the classics. All right. So um, again, you go to get this reference to Baroque art, which was usually the curtains and the columns were usually reserved for um, uh, uh, kings. Right? For example, just think of Velasquez as you know Charles V. You've always got the curtains around. So the grand tourist is seen as, as a grand man, an aristocrat in a theatre-like setting, um, but on the uh, sort of on the liminal in a liminal position between two worlds. Uh, here we have sort of uh, the, the Colosseum as it was depicted by Canaletto. Uh, Can Canaletto actually comes to Rome and does quite a few. Um, it had been, uh, it's shown as, as, as absolutely decrepit, right? And uh, the way in which the Italians are not taking, paying any attention to the grandeur of their past. You've got goats and all the rest of it here. In fact, it actually hadn't been excavated at this time. In fact, it, it took uh, Napoleon to when he took over Rome, he, with his usual efficiency, organised all the um, prisoners to come out and dig. And they, they were the ones who actually began digging up and taking out the layers um, of, of the Colosseum and uh, dug up most of what is now the uh, Roman Forum. Um, at the time, of course, the Roman tourists would have sort of seen this as awful. You know, the church has taken over the Colosseum. Um, you can see these little sort of fences which had been put up by the Pope and so on. So this idea of utter decay, I mean, not just is it falling down by time, but it's been pillaged by um, the, uh, the church, all the, uh, all the gold, uh, not the gold, but all of the marbles been taken from it. All right, well, let's get back to, um, that's another one just sort of showing you the gesture. Oh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. All right, Ramsey, you would have perhaps heard of him. What is going on in England at the time? You've got Alan Ramsey, who's a pupil of Hudson. Um, he is the person who is going to paint um, George III and um, his wife, uh, Queen Charlotte. Again, this was actually quite a controversial portrait at the time because uh, he uh, deliberately uh, makes her look as though she's a mulatto. And she was supposed to have been descended from a black uh, Portuguese uh, princess, something like five generations back. And uh, Ramsay deliberately makes her look like this. And this painting was actually taken out and uh, disseminated through the uh, colonies. And it was taken up as a kind of, you know, a banner by the uh, abolitionists uh, who saw, look, even if our queen is black, uh, therefore there is hope. Um, who were the other painters? I just go through this. Right, you've got Gainsborough, who is painting in this time. You've got, I just wanted to, to um, I thought some of you might recognise this from that horrendously awful film. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was told to borrow it because it had some hidden meaning, which I've yet to find. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's quite interesting that uh, this is the picture of her. She's leaning on a, on a sacrophagus. This is the other woman in, in, the, in the plot um, po with her portrait by Reynolds, who was the other one at the time. And also I've got a portrait of the husband by Batoni. So I just wanted to show you how you actually have the three of them. And they all look as absolutely hideous as they are on the screen. <laughs> all right, now this, um, this is particularly interesting because he's really, obviously, that the 
the painter, but he could not find anything interesting to do with this man. I mean, if you, if you, com if you compare this with the other paintings that Patoni does, he looks like an absolute dolt. All right, now, um, Mengs also was painting at the time. Now, Mengs, who was the lover of Winkleman, um, and he, you will see the same sort of, you're getting this repertoire now of gestures uh, as you get with, um, with Batoni. So what I'm really trying to say then is that um, Batoni is not the, this great inspired artist. He's someone who is a workmanlike artist who has put together um, a type of portrait which is what is required by a grand tourist, which is dictated in many ways by the English sense of identity and who they are. And that Batoni takes these aspects from other painters and styles. That's really what I'm trying to say, to produce this particular um, one. Now here we've gone back to Wyndham, Natchable Wyndham. Now, um, all right. Remember, we, what I want to look at now is the costume. All right, now at the time, no one wore Van Dyke collars. Not the, you know, they weren't even available in op shops. Um, whereas um, he has been painted wearing this, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't even have been carnival costume. Now, why is he there? Because they are trying to reference the Van Dyke collar. All right, this is because this would fit in on the walls with um, his ancestors. Now, what we have here then is a more subtle. Um, representation of the young man in Rome. Remember that the importance of this portrait was he, he's been there, done that, all right? I've been to Rome, I've been to the seat of the classics, I've absorbed the ideas of, of empire, virtue, and so on. So, so therefore, what do you actually have here is the temple of the Sibyl at Tivoli. All right, so you actually it's a much more subtle reference than having the color, you know the Colosseum stuck in the background. Um, the Sibyl, of course, as someone who was foresees the future, and the Sibyls were sort of ended up being assimilated into the persona of kind of prophetesses of the Old Testament at, at this time. So therefore, um, the Sibyl, of course, means knowledge. All right, so that's why he has this particular attribute. Uh, and he's been looked at by um, a particular statue, which is the statue of Minerva. Um, Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. Uh, however, she's also sometimes the goddess of war, and in fact she has her helmet on and he has his sword. So therefore he has the attributes of wisdom and being part of the warrior class, um, being an aristocrat. All right, so those are the two aspects of antiquity which are important. That was just the Tivoli Gardens where the uh, little um, temple was. Now we get back to Wyndham again, and I wanted to look at his stance. Um, this again was particular stance with the hand reaching out. We've seen that it's appeared in already in many other portrait types. But at the time, there was the discovery of the Apollo Belvedere, which was exhibited on at the uh, Capitoline Museum. Right now, the Capitoline Museum opens in 1793, but these, that statue would have been exhibited in the courtyard in there. So the grand tourists would have already had a canon of things that they had to go and see. They had books very like Lonely Planet, you know, where to stay, you know, which inns had the least cockroaches, you know, where can you get a good cup of tea? I mean, very, very similar with the way in which we sort of, in Michelin things, you get two stars or three stars. The Apollo Belvedere would have had a three star. All right, and this would have been where they'd have all gone. This is the Capitoline Museum with the ancient, well, there's lessons of courage, devotion to duty, stoicism and virility. Virility in the sense of, of, of courage and, and moral uprightness, not the sense that it's given today. So here you have the grand tourists and here you have these sort of silly Italians uh, over here, um, very clearly different uh, in their dress. Um, they're interested in everyday things, whereas these are men of, uh, these are connoisseurs, these are men who are discussing things, contemplating the beauties of the ancient world. So Wyndham, natural Wyndham, is literally the embodiment of the ancient world. He is the embodiment of what these statues meant, the highest ideals of beauty. Remember, we had Winkleman at the time who was talking now about the aesthetics of beauty, which is embodied in the ideals of Greek statues. So um, the, he, he then sort of embodies this idea of, of, uh, of moral uprightness and beauty. All right, now we have, um, he doesn't always paint the, um, uh, sitter in um, uh, a total, uh, you know, freestanding position. Sometimes we have these um, 
close-ups, more or less. And unfortunately, this, because of the light, you can't see very well here, but um, uh, it's, you get a, a much more immediate impression of, of the sitter. And Batoni was sought after, one of the reasons was, was that he was a, a, able to paint a very good likeness. Now, I just have to leave that one. Now, I want to go on to Charles Compton, 7th Earl of Northampton. Those of you who thought he might have been the 6th were wrong, all right. Um, and this is a, a, an interesting painting. Now, he was uh, a young man at the time. I think he was in his early 20s, as you would be if you were on the Grand Tour. Uh, already had developed tuberculosis and uh, would die uh, two years later. Uh, he was immensely wealthy and in invested in buying books. He had an enormous library. Uh, books were being constantly sent back to England. So he's seen here um, again with Minerva looking at him. Now why have we constantly got Minerva? Um, a, well it is wisdom, that's one of the reasons why they're there, but also it's because um, Pompeo Batoni was connected to uh, the Al uh, Cardinal Albani and Cardinal Albani uh, was the proud owner of this particular Minerva bust. So that's one of the reasons why it appears there. All right, now I think I'm looking at the position of this person, all right? Um, this is the marble fawn. I don't know if, if any of you have been to the Capital Art Museum or read Nathaniel <coughs> Hawthorne's The Marble Thorn, a marble fawn? No, it, it's the quintessential book of the Grand Tour. You virtually you know, each chapter you go through a different place of the Grand Tour and all the ghastly things that happen. Someone, a Protestant, becomes a Catholic and, you know, all the terrible things that happen to you if you indulge in the Grand Tour too much. Anyhow, the, the main character is a person who is a, a carefree Italian, you know, who's, who's treated, spoken of in the most degrading terms by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And then he witnesses a murder, in fact, he, he kills someone. Uh, and he loses all his fawn-like characteristics uh, and ends up in the dungeon somewhere. It's, it's, if you can read the turgid prose, it's quite interesting if you're going on a grand tour. Anyway, so this then was one of the pieces that people came and marvelled at. And you will notice then the way in which this young man is depicted is that again he is the embodiment of the marble fawn. All right, the, sort of the carefree Bacchanalian aspect of the Italian people purified through Greek art. Now, the other thing that is of interest here is the dog. All right. Now, um, I just want to look at another piece uh, which would have been seen by the grand tourist. You know, after the you know the Colosseum and, and so on, you would go and have a look at these reliefs. And one of them is the Endymion relief. Um, <clears throat> Endymion who, who dies with his hunting dog, uh, the way in which this dog is kind of in a contrapuntal position will be taken up very much by the dog here, who is in a rather athletic pose, you must admit, um, per perching on the side of the chair. Now, um, most of uh, Batoni's paintings, all the full lengths of them, have a dog in it. Now, this is, is to reference several things. First of all, that endymion relief, the importance of the kind of the greyhound. Um, secondly, he uses it um, to connect the foreground with the sitter. So we go from the dog inwards. Um, we're also given an insight into the character um, of or personality of the sitter. Um, you know, he's someone who is uh, worthy of respect. I mean, the dog is looking at him with sort of in adoration, in a kind of submissive manner, which is the way in which an English aristocrat should be treated. Uh, and also you get the, um, but Batoni uh, works very much on the lustrous qualities uh, of materials. Now this is, the, you get the velvet, you get the, um, I'm not sure, I think it's a squirrel that was lining, I don't know how many animals died in, to produce this painting, but um, you have this extraordinary sort of like over the top costume, but also the sheen on the dog's coat is contrasting with the fur um, on the uh, earl. So you get a very, quite a sensuous um, effect produced by the dog. Now, um, other things are actually um, uh, brought out in these paintings. Now, William Coke, first Earl of Leicester, um, had his portrait done in 1773. Now, this was not long after the Jacobean uprising, uh, which we're going to talk about with another <coughs> sitter in a moment. And he actually was the lover of Bonnie Prince Charlie's wife. 
which wasn't difficult, I think there, had, there were a few. Um, but he is depicted here, now you see he doesn't have Minerva looking at him here. Um, this is particular um, statue was thought to be of Cleopatra, in actual fact I think now it's Niobe crying. But of course Cleopatra, you know, the, the, the queen who is constantly seduced by the Romans, etc. She's there looking, you know, in a rather lascivious pose, I mean not quite comme il faut for a Roman statue and he's looking away from her in a disdainful sort of way. Uh, so this is quite an interesting um, reference to his sort of um, affairs. He was a well-known rake, a well-known sort of Casanova. Um, and he also, I just wanted to show you um, a painting by Van Dyck. You can see um, very, very clearly the way in which the two have been taken together. Right, the stance is very similar. Instead of the stash of armour, which would be uh, not correct for a grand tourist, you've got the dog, the adoring dog, which leads you right up to the face um, of the sitter. Um, he's a bit of a dandy, the way in which he's, you know, the hat's being sort of you know, doffed here, whereas um, you have the opposite here. You have someone who is, just, who is obviously a warrior, but the colours and the stance and the, the outfit um, are very similar. Um, the stance also um, could be taken from Malaga, all right? That person we saw before, if you look, at, look back, look at him again, it's again, he is the embodiment of an ancient statue. Uh, I just wanted to show you another person, who uh, Thomas Crowell, who was someone who was again very interested in uh, Horace and in the manuscripts of Horace, um, but was also a bit of a rake. And so you have um, the same statue here looking sort of uh, lovingly at him, uh, but it is balanced by sort of Hercules <laughs> in the background. So he's got it both ways. But again, the dog bringing us in to the painting up. You see the way you come in from the foreground, up through the hand, up through the arm, which reiterates in a different way the curve here, zigzagging towards the face. Now probably the most interesting of these um, people, uh, of the messages that you actually get uh, in um, Bom Pompeo Batoni's paintings is this portrait of Colonel William Gordon, who was a Scot, which you would not have guessed, I suppose. <laughs> now. Um, what was interesting at the time was it, what stands out in this painting. There, there are two things that stand out. First of all, it's the belligerence of this man's pose. Now, the others, you know, were rather a feat or dreamy or, or sort of academic, whereas this man um, is presenting himself clearly as a warrior. Uh, and a warrior who is sort of on the loose, you know, he's not someone who has laid down his arms, he was someone, he's, con he's eyeballing, you know, the, the statue of, of, of Rome, in fact he's really taking it right up to her in many ways, and you'll notice in the background you don't have a little kind of temple or a little representation of the Colosseum, you've got this huge piece of the Colosseum, right, representing the might of the Flavian Empire. Now what's it all about? Well, first of all, you've got um, this particular man wearing the belted tartan. Now, at the time this was painted, it was forbidden for Scots to wear the belted tartan because they had been defeated uh, by the Hanoverians, by the British, and you wore the tartan on uh, the first time you got, I think you got some kind of massive fine, the second time you wore it, you were um, dispatched out to colonies or imprisoned. So it was um, a terrible offence, and the British were attempting to um, diminish all uh, aspects of uh, Scottish nationhood. So it is forbidden to wear it, but, so in other words, he would have had to pack it in his bag to bring it over to Rome to be painted in it so that he can go back and have it hung on the walls uh, in a place where it's, it's not supposed to be. So it was a, a real act of subversion in many ways on the part of this Lord. Uh, and you get uh, Batoni obviously working with him on this. Now what Batoni, what he's trying to do, uh, this sitter, obviously has a political agenda. Uh, and the agenda is that of the survival of the Scottish nationality, the, Sco the, the, the tr traits of what made the Scots great. And because they have been defeated by the British, uh, and in fact the British were actually at the time um, trying to sort of had taken over where Hadrian's Wall had been and were doing all sorts of things, he is now trying to place via this wearing of the tartan um, Scottish 
greatness back in the days when the Scots, as the Caledonians, had been the thorn in the side of Hadrian, of, of, the, of the Roman legions. And in fact, the Romans had given up, and that's why they, they built Hadrian's Wall, to sort of keep them out, to have a demarcation line. So therefore, this posturing, all right, um, is showing, first of all, Rome, the statue of Rome, is offering him the orb of peace, all right? And here he is with his sword at rest on, on the ground. Um, so in other words, he's showing him, himself as a Caledonian, had not defeated Rome, but Rome had given up trying to conquer the Caledonians, the Scots, and had sought peace. And this is represented very much by the same sort of dynasty that was fighting against the Scots at the time. It was the same who built the Colosseum. So that's why you've got this reference to the Colosseum, massive Colosseum, and it's seen as being the massive wonder of the ancient world, not a fiddling little tourist thing, all right? So in other words, us, we as Scots, were able to stand up to the British. And so what he does, he asks Batoni to um, make this look like a Roman toga. And you will see that it's pulled down. Um, so this skirt looks very much like the Roman toga uh, with the flowing thing at the back. Um, the socks have been pulled up to look like Roman buskins as well. All right? So there's a reference up to the Roman legions. And it really is a request in many ways saying that the, the Scots have their own glory, their own past, they should be included in the concept of the government of, of, of Great Britain. Because there was real Scots main, a Scots of, you know, people hated the Scots uh, in uh, Parliament. And the dual aspect of this character is very interesting because he, underneath the belted tar uh, tartan of the Scot, emerges the fact that he's actually a colonel in the Hanoverian army. All right? So he's, he's, you know, he's sort of really, it is showing that und underneath the Scots identity is a true uh, Great Britain. Uh, so it's, it's a very important painting. It's not just sort of someone posing uh, on the edge um, of a sarcophagus. All right, I'll, just, I'll just quickly get onto this. This is most unusual having a group portrait. Uh, here you've got the, the names again say it all, so what can Williams win? Uh, who was the fourth baronet, William Appleyne, Captain, I don't know, William Thomas Appleyne, don't know, he doesn't have a title, I mean, is he worth looking at? Um, Captain Edward Hamilton, and the three of them actually are gesturing, you get this gesturing here, he obviously is interested in music, um, he is gesturing towards the central person, or appears to be the central person, um, who is making this sign, which is probably the sign of virtue, this is probably something referring to the fact that they belong to a Neoplatonic society, and this is Sir Watkin Williams win here, um, behind here you actually have a statue of, of painting pointing towards him. He actually has a sketch of uh, taken that he's done in the uh, Rafa of Raphael's stanzas in the Vatican. Um, so these people are sort of seen as this quintessential group of connoisseurs, sort of music, music, Dante, which is open here, literature and painting, and of course the adoring dogs leading us that you'll see become almost staple form coming in to the painting. Now, I mean, people, the other aristocrats, when they went back to England, they actually used to go to each other's baronial halls. You know, it was like they used to do a kind of grand tour of the grand tour, if you, if you know what I mean. And so they would see, um, it would just be common fact, you know, you'd get, the, oh, it's a Batoni, you know what I mean? It's how comforting about him. He did a couple of women, um, but of course it's quite different, isn't it? Uh, she looks very pretty. Uh, the accent is very much on what she's wearing. Um, there's no Minerva imparting wisdom, you've got no Colosseum, you've got no ruins, you've got, just got a cute little dog which references very much uh, the way a woman is supposed to be. Uh, as Napoleon said, teach why, Swabel, just shut up and look good. <laughs> All right, um, um, but he also did uh, a couple of great portraits here of, of the kings, Leopold and Joseph of Austria. Uh, you've got Minerva here looking a bit downcast because th <laughs> things weren't going to go too well at the changeover of power. Um, an interesting one too here where he's trying to represent the Marquis Wills Hill, Earl of Hillsborough, later Marquis of Downshire, um, his poor wife died um, while he was on the grand tour. So to commemorate her, because um, he actually has a, a painting of her here on uh, a sarcophagus, the dog is, is lying down, you know, I suppose representing sort of mourning. Um, this is Hyman, this is the god of, of marriage, and he's sort of looking 
um, you know, rather sad uh, as he looks at her. So it's a, it was an interesting way of a woman being incorporated <laughs> uh, in a Grand Tour painting. Uh, by the eight, by the seven, middle of towards the end of the 19th century, as I said, the tour becomes now something that is no longer uh, you're no longer there to become a better Englishman. You're there to become a better person by communing with nature, to understanding the ancient world, and so you now have the new type of portrait, which is. Um, so Brooke Boothby by uh, Joseph Darby, and here you have the sort of character communing with nature, sort of thinking about the afterlife and so on. Very different from the Batoni portrait that we saw. Um, I just want to uh, quickly look at the other portraitist um, who was uh, used extensively by the Grand Tourists, and uh, this was Rosalba Carriera, who was a pastel painter living in Venice, and a woman, which is amazing. Well, I just wanted to set the scene for you. The grand tourists going to Venice, remember the importance of getting your canaletto, getting your veduta, so that you can have them on one side of the door of the dining room, uh, and so on. Uh, this is Rosalba Carriera. Uh, she started out in life as a painter of miniatures. Um, this, of course, would be the way most women would start. Um, it was, you know, a female art form. She started out um, etching, at least engraving, um, ivory, which, you know, the, the very, very fine work, and this is possibly why she actually went blind later on in her life. She then progressed to using pastels, and by the time, at the height of her career, was probably one of the, the best known portrait painters in Europe. She was invited several times to the court um, of Louis the XV um, and was invited to many other places but uh, preferred to, to stay home. She, she never married and devoted herself entirely to these portraits. Now this is a portrait of herself and they're very different from those you know pompous Pompeo Batoni paintings we saw before. Um, if you wanted the statist one, you, you did your Batoni. If you wanted the more intimate sort of psychological portrait, you got this from Rosalba Carriera in Venice. So you would have these as well uh, in your main hall. Um, now, I just wanted to show you some very sort of self uh, self portraits. This is her at the height of her career. This is her very much as an old woman. Sorry. Uh, sort of very much warts and all sort of painting with uh, and a great sort of psychological depth to the portrait as well. And there is there is only the face for us to go on. We have no attributes. Um, however, when she came to painting the uh, Grand Tourists, and I've used this before, so some of you will know this very well, um, she was attempting to show, or the Grand Tourists wanted something else to be shown. And this was, again, this idea of the Englishman who remains an Englishman, the solid characteristics that remain will always remain, even though you've been in the den of iniquity, of popishness, even though you've been to the sort of Venice, as we saw last week, you know, the courtesans and carnivals and this society totally upside down, the real Englishman always comes through. And this is shown very clearly in this portrait. Um, the man is sort of seen, turned, sort of his body is turned one way and his head is turned the other. And uh, just the way his uh, Englishness is turned away from his Venetian facade. So in other words, he has taken away the mask of the carnival. So this is the batuta that you have here with the a uh, long piece of lace that would have covered the bottom part of his face. Um, he's pushed aside his disguise, he pushed aside the superficial aspects of his um, European persona <coughs> and um, emerges as this very steady, steady-gazed, self-possessed, cultured young man who also um, is wearing very relaxed clothing. Um, no, this was sort of kind of the sort of thing that you would have worn at the in, inside. Uh, um, so this then is a sort of quintessential grand tourist uh, portrait from Venice. Uh, I just want to refer back to this idea of the, the carnival that we saw last week. Now, uh, one thing that you do does come across with all of these paintings, and particularly with um, these ones of Rosalba, is the utter arrogance of these people. I mean, I. I don't think it's quite so obvious with the Batoni ones because the pose is so over the top that it, it tends to be absorbed by that. But here where you only have this sort of self-assured, 
born to rule aspect you, it, and that's that's what was required and it's certainly what is given and again you have see the the um the mask which has been pushed aside and it really is very much like a mask of a whole face it's not just of the top so this the superficiality of of of, of european culture the superficial side gives way always to the real Englishman. Be I just wanted to look at the beautiful uh, work on the pastels uh, of the costume. Um, she also did some rather risque little paintings. Now, um, particularly uh, this lady with the parrot. Now, the parrot always was related to um, eroticism in, in, in art. If you've got a parrot, it, it means something about you. Uh, this woman was quite possibly one of the courtesans of the time. She's certainly not dressed for, for winter weather um, and uh, the amount of jewellery uh, would make you think that she certainly isn't a, a real Venetian lady as we saw last week. Remember that the Venetian women only wore jewellery basically uh, uh, in the year after their marriage and after that didn't. Um, but again another, another lady and this time with a monkey which also <laughs> is, a, is a reference very much to sort of seductive powers. Um, I just wanted to show you the delicacy of, of her palette uh, and the rather beautiful painting here. These um, very good representations of women. Oh, and this is when she went to the French court uh, and captured Louis XV um, when he was the, the Dauphin. So you get this very fine, sort of delicate use of pastels, uh, Watteau, and um, her style will influence Greuze uh, in, in, in Paris, all right? These very sort of delicate allegorical paintings and her style also will influence uh, Quentin de la Tour uh, uh, and the way in which he's positioned sort of slightly on a, on a slant uh, against a pale background. Uh, de la Tour also paints Madame de Pompadour. Uh, Rosalba Carriera um, painted a number of sitters. She didn't just paint a grand tourist, whereas for Batoni, um, I think of something like 300 or 400 paintings that he did, only I think, um, I think there were 20 who, which were of Italians. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, Carriera actually paints um, her own people. And here we have the last painting that I have of her is this very deeply spiritual one. This is actually in the um, Caritzonico, some of you would have seen it, I think, um, of uh, Sister Maria Caterina, this sort of very deep sort of spirituality, which is rendered very well by the sort of the pastel uses. Now, I just want to go back then to uh, something that you all would know, which is in our um, National Gallery. Uh, Sir Samson Gideon, <laughs> later First Earl Eardley, and an unidentified gentleman. Now you wouldn't really feel too hot if you were the unidentified person. And it's quite difficult for us now to identify who is the unidentified person. I mean, who would you say is the unidentified person? The blue one or the, or the red one? How many for blue? Oh, you're being very canny. <laughs> all right. Now, of course, it's a dead giveaway after having looked at all of these Batoni paintings. It is, of course, Sir Samson Gideon is, of course, this man here. Now, he is, why? Because he is the person who is being lovingly looked at by Minerva, all right? Uh, so we now have the absolutely quintessential uh, uh, Grand Tour painting, uh, even more so in many ways than the natural, natural Wyndham. Um, we have the background here with the same curtain, with the same tassel, uh, looking through a kind of a window into the ancient world. And what a part of the ancient world is it? It is the temple of uh, the Sibyl at Tivoli. It becomes all frightfully repetitious after you've seen a few of these, I might add. All right, so it's looking through. So the old, the you know, wisdom of the ancient world via the statue of Minerva, looking straight down at him. All right, so that's what we've had before. There's an added aspect with this one, and this is the idea that the grand tourist, when he came back, not only went into Parliament and shared his wisdom with and um, his worth for the rest of the nation, but he carried on his line. That was, you know, dynasty was very, very important, and it was rather at, at stake here because a lot of them brought back other things besides statues, uh, one of which was syphilis, and um, there was a sort of 
a great lowering of the birth rate uh, towards the end of the 18th century. So therefore it was extremely important to perpetuate the, the line, the male line, etc. because women I don't think could inherit, could they? I'm not sure they can't, couldn't in France. All right, so here we have what they are doing here. These two men are bonding over their experiences, but also he's showing a cameo of his bride-to-be. All right, so this is these male bonding, reference to the past, and continuity through uh, the uh, future marriage. And we have, of course, the same dog looking up uh, through the dog up to this man here, and from his arm we go down here and through to the main focus, which is this person here. It's very cleverly balanced with the red, bright red here on the red chair um, outlining uh, the main aspect um, of, the, of, the, of the painting. So there we have it really, um, by now you'll be an expert in Pompeo Batoni um, paintings if ever should, you should go to England and see them, they are in all the stately halls of, 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 of London and, and England. Um, but uh, the point I really was trying to make is that this was the sort of major portrait type uh, of the 18th century and it was an English innovation. So thank you very much. Thank you.